All right, let's get started. So just a reminder, the roadmap of where we are on homework four is we're through all of the content up until AO3. So you can do everything up to AO2. Everything's out there. I'm done talking about all this stuff. I'll be happy to answer questions and stuff, but I don't have any new lecture content on anything LO1, LO2, AO1, AO2. All that stuff's out there. You're good to go on that stuff. AO3, it's going to take me like a week, maybe four lectures to talk about AO3. Uh, I mentioned this on Friday, but this is one of them topics where I got a lot to talk about in lecture. Uh, there's tons of background information and just a lot going on with HTTPS. But when it comes to actually coding this in your homework, it's not that much. Uh, there's not a lot that you actually have to do uh, because we are going to use libraries for a lot of it. So this is like a week, possibly four lectures, where you can kind of chill a little bit, enjoy all the background material, and then when it comes to doing it on your homework, uh, it shouldn't be too complicated, uh, especially because I go through a demo uh, next week. I'll, um, I don't think it. I don't think it fits on Friday. I think I'll start it Friday and then like start it over and do the whole thing on Monday. Maybe it's probably going to be the plan. Uh, but I'll go through the whole demo of everything that you need to do for HTTPS, and you hell you could follow along during lecture and get it done right there, or watch a lecture video and get it done that way. Uh, so should be an easy objective. This is not like the other AO3s on the last two homeworks. Uh, this one is, should be, I keep guys say should because the, it's one of the things where you can, if one thing is misconfigured by like one character, uh, it could take you hours to find that and debug it. Uh, so it's one of those kinds of things, but it is like 10 lines of configuration. So uh, it shouldn't be too hard to just very carefully follow the demo and lecture and get all this stuff done. But we have, like I said, we got tons of background. Today and Wednesday is all just background, so we can start talking about how to do HTTPS in your assignment. So with that, let's get into it. And I, I don't know about y'all, but I think the background is super fun. I like encryption stuff. So uh, let's talk about it. I think the whole course is fun, so I guess that's redundant. But especially the encryption stuff. Um, I just find it, I don't know, I find it fascinating. All the web stuff too, but encryption kind of—it's like kind of magical. Well, the internet is too. It's kind—it's all kind of magical until you learn how it works. And then it's like, oh yeah, it's just like like encryption. We're gonna find out it's just math, just math, and it and it works to give us the perception of magic, just like the internet. It's just wires, but it makes it seem like it's magic. Uh, all right, so. Everybody can see your packets, right? Uh, this, is, this is an issue. You're using the internet, you're sending information all around the world, and people can see what those packets are. So anybody handling those packets can see them. That's your ISP. If you're on campus, it's UBIT. They can see your packets. Any tier one networks, even if you don't deal with tier one networks directly, they're handling your packets as they're going through the internet. UB is plugged into several tier one networks. Your ISP is plugged in the tier one networks. You really don't have a choice. The tier one networks are going to handle your packets with their network, all their technology. Um, but there can be an argument that, whatever, I trust these three entities. I, I trust every, like the people who built the internet and make the internet available to me, including UBIT, who built this huge infrastructure to, that sprawls campus and lets us connect to the Wi Fi all the time even though we complain that sometimes it, it's slow and stuff, but they still offer this service. And we can say, you know what, we trust them, right? But do you trust everybody in your Wi-Fi range? The way the Wi-Fi works is we're connected to either this access point or this one is probably what you're connected to. Oh, we got two in the back too. We got four in this room. You're connected to one of these access points. Your wireless access, your wireless card doesn't shoot a beam of internet of bytes over to this thing. It broadcasts it in all directions, 
And then this access point is going to know, or whatever one I'm connected to, is going to know to listen for that signal and say, oh, that signal's for me. Let me send that down its way to the next router and route it through the UB network and eventually through the internet at large. And then it's going to send that messages back. It's going to broadcast, hey, Jesse's laptop, this message is for you. And my laptop says, ooh, that one's for me. But guess what? That signal's hitting everybody's network card in this room. It's hitting everybody's card, and you can just listen to those packets. You can just grab anybody's information out of the air and access it, just read it. Uh, and uh, I don't do, maybe someday I'll do a demo of this. Um, I, I can never get a demo working the way I want it to. But there's software like Wireshark, some of you have probably used before. Uh, other classes, I think Modern Networking Concepts has you install Wireshark and mess around with packets and stuff. Uh, it's software you can download, because usually your computer just doesn't tell you about all the packets it's receiving that aren't for you. It just ignores them, like it should. But if you install something like Wireshark, it shows you everything that's hitting your, your wireless card. So every, all the information that's floating in the air, you can use software like that to just read it all. Should, should be scared, or you shouldn't be scared. Let me rephrase that one. It's got, it can be scary that everybody can see uh, what you're doing on the internet. And this traffic includes your passwords. So don't panic, because of course the whole thing we're heading towards is HTTPS. Everything's encrypted in the air and people can't, uh, can't read much of that information. But if we didn't have a solution to this, this does include your passwords in plain text. Your passwords are going through the air in plain text. Now, they're encrypted, like I mentioned, so we're good. But sites will send your password in plain text. And I like to challenge you all with this. Well, not quite a challenge. But give me any website that requires a password to log in, any website at all, and I'll go to that website, and it'll send your password in plain text. So in chat, raise your hand or whatever. I'll go to any website. In an incognito window. I'll go to any website. Chase.com. I'm going to check the packets going through the air. Username. I'll be Jesse. I'm going to type in a password. I'm going to sign in. Oh, I wasn't on the network tab. No, it got me anyway. Zoom in. Let's go to that request that I sent, a get request. That's not the right one. Where's my, where's my post request? Get, get, get. Did it redirect me? Let me let me do this again. I don't want to use a filter. I'm going to do preserved log. I think it redirected me. I'm going to go to sign in. Of course, it's going to be slow as crap. I made it to a different page somehow. Post request for login. That's going to be the one. Let me scroll down. Look at this mess. Content type. Those are all headers. Uh, there it is. Not my password. Plain text. So in the request, in the body of the request, it's a post request, but in the body, it's URL form encoded. In view source, it'll be you know that mess that we saw. So if we parse that, there's the password I sent. That one website, is that all? all right, I'll go to another one. They all do it. Every site's going to send that password in plain text.
I found, I've been doing this for a while. There's only one that I found which kind of hashes, but, uh, but in a strange way. Only on their mobile version of their site, and their desktop version doesn't do anything. It just sends plain text. Why? Why don't they hash this? Why don't they encrypt? Well, it is encrypted. It's HTTPS. So don't, there's no need to panic. Everyone in the room can't get your password. Yeah? Sure. Um, but the hacker, we assume that the hackers know how we're hashing. So we can't assume any security out of that. They'll figure out how we're hashing. Plus, everybody's hashing with bcrypt. They pretty much know how we're hashing. Uh, but yes, it would be. So if we're trying to use that as part of our security, maybe we home bake our own hash function. Um, yeah, we would lose that obscurity if we had that on the front end. Actually, that is part of it, to piggyback off that in a, in a better way. Um, anything we put on the front end, the attacker can see. So anything we do, they know what we're doing. But why not hash? If they see the hash function and they get the hash of our password, they can't get the password. If it's a strong password, they can't get the password even if they can get this request, if they can see this decrypted HTTP request. So why not hash it? Wouldn't it be more secure? I'll give you two reasons why, why they ain't going to hash it. Bless you. One, it doesn't help. So what you need to log in to somebody's account isn't their password. It's whatever the client side is sending to the server. In this case, it's the password. In all cases, it's the password. So it is actually the password. But it's whatever the client is sending to the server. So if the client is hashing the password and then sending the hash, well, the server's just expecting that hash value. If the server's not expecting the password, you don't need to know their password. You just need to know that hash value. You send a request that says Jesse and then the hash of my password and the server is sitting there expecting Jesse and a hash of my password, you never need to know my password. You just need to know what the client is sending to the server because that's what the server expects and that's what the server is going to authenticate. It's going to use that to authenticate. So hashing wouldn't really help. And reason two, if we hash the password first, client side, and then sent it, then server side, we can't do any password verification. So we have some password verification on the client side, but it's all just for you, user experience, just UX stuff, to make sure you have one capital, one lowercase, one number, you know, certain, uh, uh, one special character, length eight, is this pretty much the standard, for better or worse. Uh, mostly worse, because as we saw last time, it's not enough entropy. But, uh, but we have those checks client side just to help you, like as you're typing, you see the boxes check off, some sites have that stuff. But when you send your password to the server side, guess what the server's gonna do? It's not gonna trust its users. It's never gonna trust its users. Never trust your users, seriously. Never trust your users. Because the users can just rip all that JavaScript out of there and send you two as their password, just the number two. And if that's hashed client side, the server's not even gonna know that that's a weak password unless the server gets the hash and tries to crack it and says, I was able to crack your password in 0.2 seconds, try again. Uh, and that's shady at best. Uh, so we send the plain text password, then the server can do its server side checks for the password strength, not relying on the front end, make sure you have uppercase, lowercase, et cetera, whatever password criteria they have, they're gonna check that server side, and then if it's a bad password, they're going to kick it back and say, hey, try again. You can't do that if you hash the password client side. So you don't get any upside. There's no extra security because an attacker is just going to take whatever you send, and that is effectively your password. The hash is effectively your password if you hash client side. And you have downside in that there's less things you can do server side with a hash of the password than with the raw plain text password. Um, so Pretty much any site with one kind of exception, mobile version of one uh, Bank of America, I think it was, 
And I think it's not, uh, it's not a crypto, I believe it's not a cryptographic hash function. I believe they're just doing something strange, some strange encoding. Um, but only one time I found something that didn't do plain text passwords. Why can't someone just decrypt it? That'll be a topic for, well, actually today we're starting that conversation. Um, topic for today and Wednesday. Why don't they just decrypt it? The short answer is they won't be able to, not without the server's private key. The long answer is encryption, all about encryption. So everyone in our Wi-Fi range could just recover your password, but it's going to be encrypted. That's what we want. We want encryption such that they're not going to be able to read anything that we're sending over the internet. So we're just going to slap an S on our HTTPS and call it a day. Uh, so HTTPS is the protocol we want. If it's HTTPS, it's encrypted. If it's HTTP, it's unencrypted. And more specifically, it's not HTTPS. It's HTTP over TLS. But that takes too long to say, so we just say HTTPS or HTTP secure or secure HTTP. Um, but it means encrypted. Either way, it's encrypted with TLS. So that's going to be our, our answer to this. And I'll get a little ahead of myself. I'll, I'll, I believe I have a slide on this either today or Wednesday. But, um, but just to wrap up that conversation, they won't be able to see somebody sniffing packets out of the air. They won't be able to see what you're saying because all of your all of your HTTP requests are going to be encrypted. Your HTTP requests and responses are going to be encrypted. Your IP and TCP headers will not. So they can't see what you're saying, but they can still see who you're saying it to and who's sending messages to you. So they can still see, most importantly, the IP headers of source and destination IP address. Anybody in this room can sniff packets and see what sites you're connecting to. If I ever go really crazy one day, I could have a laptop sitting here sniffing packets all lecture, and I can sit here and get say, hey, who, who's on Twitter right now? And just be a grumpy old professor like that. Uh, I can do that. It's within the technology that we have. Now, I might get false positives because it might be someone in the next lecture hall and stuff. So there's practical reasons not to do that other than the insanity reasons not to do that and the privacy invasion reasons not to do that. Um, but it's something that can be done with the technology we have. Any one of you could see what other people are doing. Not what you're doing, but what sites other people are visiting online. Uh, and that's why VPNs are still so popular. Even though everything's encrypted, the VPN is going to hide who you're connecting to. So you can effectively hide that data. Uh, people still get information. They still know that you're connecting to a VPN. So they still know you're trying to hide something. But it's uh, actually probably more suspicious. <laughs> I would go to the student using the VPN before anyone else because uh, you got something to hide. But anyway, getting too far off on the tangent. So what we want to use, want to use is encryption. So we want to send some... Yeah. So if you use Tor, can you still see the packets? No, no. So Tor is like using a whole bunch of VPNs, like chain back to back. So they can see that you're using the Tor network. Somebody sophisticated enough would say, oh, that IP, that's a Tor node. Uh, they'd see you're connecting to Tor, which is even more suspicious than connecting to a VPN server. But uh, they can't see what you're doing. They just know that you're using Tor. Which for my money, I, I know you're really up to something if you're using Tor. Like, nobody's, nobody went to Tor to like, look at pictures of cats. It just doesn't happen. Uh, you're going to there to do something that you can't do on the open internet or uh, something that you could do but that you want to hide. Our login submissions 200 or 300 response. Um, for the homework, I forget off the top of my head, to be honest. I think it's a redirect. Uh, in general, it could be either. Uh, whatever you want to load. If you want to redirect or just load content directly. It depends on just how you want to set up your server. In uh, the homework, it's whatever whatever I put on the homework doc. I forget off the top of my head. I want to say a redirect back to the home page, but I'm not 100%. If I were to write it right now, I would write redirect to the home page. 
Uh, so we want to send plain text, and this text can be anything. We're going to say plain text. That's just a, a cryptographic term. Plain text could be anything, but it's any text-based information. Um, anything that, uh, or sorry, not even text-based. It could be images. It could be raw bytes. Um, but anything we want to send, and then we're going to encrypt it into a cipher text with the property that anybody who has access to the cipher text can't read or can't figure out what the plain text, the underlying plain text is, and then the recipient can decrypt the cipher text back to the plain text, but only that intended recipient can decrypt it back to the plain text. So I have some message I want to send to a specific recipient. I'm going to encrypt it, send something like this over the internet. This is, if you're sniffing packets out of the air, this is what you're going to see. And then when the recipient gets that crypto text, they, and only they, can decrypt it back to my original message such that they can read that message. That's what we want. This is the feature we want. Actually, we want a few more features on this. To this end, we're going to use public key encryption, where we're going to generate a public-private key pair. So we're going to generate a public key and a private key. The public key, as the name implies, is public. You share that with everybody on the planet. The private key, as the name implies, is private. You keep that in your pocket. You don't tell anybody what that private key is. So we hide that private key. And then anybody with the public key can encrypt with the public key such that we can decrypt with the private key but anybody without the private key cannot decrypt. So these keys are intrinsically linked to each other, and anybody sending us a message encrypts with the public key, and we decrypt with the private key. As long as we keep that private key private, we are the only ones, you're the only one who can decrypt those messages. Yep. It's, it's one... I got to think of the short answer to this one. It's, it's one public-private key pair for your website, but you use those keys to generate a session key that will be a symmetric encryption key with each connection. So it's kind of both. Uh, but you, you get one, uh, like your certificate, we'll see, it'll be Wednesday's content, so I'll keep this one brief. But your uh, certificate of a website is a secure way of sharing their public key and that public key, like you look at a certificate, it'll say expires in like a year from now, or some of them are like five years from now or whatever. Uh, and they're starting to get shorter. Some of them are like 90 days, but whatever. It, it lasts for a while, and then when it expires, you'll get a new public-private key pair. But that lasts for a fairly extended period of time. Uh, can you go on Zlib using Tor to get free books? Oh, you can't. Oh, you're, I thought you were asking. You can go to Zlib using Tor to get free books, LOL. But if y'all can get on his archive, download free books there without going to Tor. I guess that, you know what? I'd be okay with that one. It's still shady depending on who you ask. If you ask me, I th I, I'd personally be okay with that one. Um, especially if you're getting textbooks. Textbooks are way too overpriced. It's ridiculous. But, uh, so these keys are inherently linked to each other, and we want two properties out of these keys. Anybody with the public key, which is everybody on the planet, is allowed to have your public key. Anybody with your public key can't determine what your private key is. Even though they're linked, they are linked together, you could figure out what the public key or private key is given the public key, but we want to make sure that that can't be done before the heat death of the universe pretty much our criteria for this one, uh, for a lot of cryptography, as we saw with passwords. We want our passwords to be strong enough that nobody's ever going to break it, no matter how much computing power they throw at it. They can never break that unless, uh, unless they torture you and get it out of you. That'd be the, the more effective way. Uh, and a, don't use that method if you're trying to get someone's password. Don't try to get someone's password to begin with, but don't do that. Uh, and... Given the ciphertext, if somebody has a ciphertext message and the public key, so they have even more information, they can't decrypt that message. They can't figure out what the plain text is unless they have the private key. And if you get deep into cryptography, there's a whole bunch more of these properties that you want. Uh, but these, we'll use these two to keep it simple for now. 
Uh, like if they have an oracle that can generate cipher, no, that's not it. I'm not going to go down that road because I don't remember off the top of my head. They do have an oracle that generates cipher text. It's called the public key. Uh, I think if they have an oracle that decrypts cipher text that's not the public key but does the same thing, they still can't figure out what your public key is. I think that's one of the stronger properties that, they, that we have. Um, and one of the encryption schemes that has this, public key encryption scheme, is RSA. This is the one that we'll talk about. I'll talk about this one in depth. There are a bunch of different strategies that generate public-private key pairs. These days, uh, in crypto, they like using elliptical curves, which are more, more secure. Uh, by more secure, I mean RSA is going to break once quantum computers become cool. Elliptical curve cryptography isn't going to. When people say cryptography is going to completely be destroyed once we have um, quantum computers, it's not true. We just got to, it's just going to be a forcing function to get us to use the coolest new thing, which is elliptical curve cryptography. It's just going to push us to do that faster. In a lot of sites, if you look at sites for a bunch of, uh, certificates for a bunch of popular sites, they're already using elliptical curve cryptography. Uh, so it's not that big of a deal. We'll just move on to the next cool thing, which is already here. And it's, uh, it amazes me that that's usually not part of the conversation of quantum computers breaking cryptography. There needs to be one smartass in every one of those conversations, like, mm, actually, elliptical curve cryptography, and then shut all that, all that chatter down. Yeah. If, if using HTTP, would your data still be unencrypted after it reaches our router, and your router sends it off? Uh, not router, but when it reaches your machine, which we're usually comfortable with. So once it gets to, like, if you're deploying your app on your server box or on your laptop when you're testing, um, Nginx is running on your machine, and Nginx is encrypting. So it gets through the router, through the access point, all the way on to my laptop, and then it's decrypted, and then sent in my internal to my laptop to my server, unencrypted with HTTP, then back to Nginx, encrypted, and then it leaves my computer. But never leaves my laptop without being encrypted. Uh, and sometimes they're distributed systems, and it's generally accepted. If you have a distributed system and the servers are in the same server room, and then they will be talking, usually through a switch, as long as you trust that and control that switch, then you can still have that be unencrypted, because somebody would have to have physical access to your server room and plug in a whole bunch of devices and stuff to read that traffic. That We're generally okay with that as well, uh, even when it's not one single device. So RSA, this is going to give us all the properties we want. Public-private key pair, the ability to encrypt with the public key, and the ability to decrypt with the private key. College textbook, textbook privacy. I assume that's a typo. Piracy is alive and well. Yeah, I can't even be mad at that. And then they, they have, like, the, the CDs or the access codes and stuff. They try to do these. I think they're the shady ones. They're doing these shady things just to... I don't want to go on this tangent. I'll just get angry. But, uh, and this is RSA. Uh, this is RSA key generation. So uh, this is the whole thing. Uh, there are a lot of like practical implementation details that, that uh, we could add to this. But this is all the math involved. It's just math. It's math. So we're going to take two large prime numbers. We're going to choose two large prime numbers. Multiply them together to generate a value n. Get our value, excuse me, lambda of n, which is the least common multiple of p minus 1 and q minus 1. We're going to choose an e. So each time we see choose, there's implementation details and reasons to choose certain numbers over other numbers, uh, which we won't get into because I don't really know all the choices, all the uh, practical implementation details. But you're going to choose an e that's less than lambda of n and is co-prime with lambda of n. So the greatest common denominator being 1 means they are co-prime to each other. They don't share any common factors. Uh, and e is less than lambda of n. Then compute d, which is the inverse, the multiplicative inverse of e modulo lambda of n. Modulo is you do all the math and then take the uh, divide by lambda of n, and take the remainder, but throw away the quotient. Right? Is that the, the answer for division quotient? 
Uh, so you, you take the uh, module operator, the percent sign in our code, um, which uh, when we're doing inverses, it gets a little, little more complicated than that, than just uh, taking the remainder. But uh, the multiplicative inverse of E modulo lambda of N, so if we had D times E mod lambda of N, it should be one, the multiplicative inverse, uh, which without modulo would just be one over E which I guess that is the notation, and I'm over explaining that one. Uh, e and N, that's your public key. Specifically E, but N kind of comes along because N has to be public for anybody to use this. So E and N are both shared with the, everybody on the planet. D is your private key. Don't tell anybody what your private key is. And then P, Q, and Lambda of N, we can throw that away. Those are only used for key generation. We don't use those as the actual keys itself. We don't use them during encryption for any reason. We want to encrypt. We take our plain text message M and raise it to the power of E modulo N. We want to decrypt. We take that ciphertext C that we just computed, raise it to the power of D modulo N, and that gets us back to the plain text M. The math all works out to have the encryption and decryption cancel each other out. We get a really nice property out of this as well. Since we're encrypting and decrypting using the same method, just different values, we actually get this nice property of our plain text message raised to the E times D modulo N is going to get us back to the plain text message. This is like encrypting and decrypting just all in one. And multiplication is commutative. So we could raise this, uh, we could do this backwards instead of encrypting with the private, uh, in instead of encrypting with the public key and decrypting with the private key, we can just do it in the other order. We can encrypt with the private key and then decrypt with the public key I have to put those in quotes because we're not, it's not encryption at that point, uh, which seems useless. If I'm going to encrypt with my private key, everybody on the planet, who, everybody has my public key, it's public, can decrypt that message. So everybody can read the message. But what that does is guarantees that I am the author of that message. This is what we call a cryptographic signature. So we can sign a message and say, I am the author of this message because you just verify that it was me because it decrypted with my public key. So usually we'll send a message and then add the signature, which is usually like a hash, a hash of the message in, uh, signed with my private key, and then you can verify that hash and the signature and everything, make sure everything checks out. You take the hash of the message, you verify the signature with my public key, make sure it's the same hash, then everything checks out. I got a signed message that you know I signed, or at the very least, somebody who has possession of my private key has signed that message. Okay, but wait a minute. We just saw a brute force attack, right? We saw a brute force attack with passwords. I store a hash of my password. Somebody comes in with a brute force or a dictionary attack or a rainbow table. Uh, they're just gonna do that. My crypto is, my uh, crypto text is flying through the air. If I'm saying, hi to someone, or I'm sending a Boolean, yes, no, true, false, and I don't have a lot of entropy, you're just going to keep guessing. You have the public key. You're going to encrypt with the public key different messages until the crypto text matches what I sent, right? It makes sense, right, at least? You're just going to launch a brute force attack. You have the means to encrypt plain text because you have the public key. It's public. Everybody has it. That's the same thing as having the hash function and constantly hashing values until you get one that matches. But we actually have an answer for this with cryptography as opposed to hashing. So since with cryptography, we're actually, the intended recipient is actually getting back to the plain text message, means that we can hide information in that plain text. We can't do this with passwords because nobody ever gets back to the original password once it's hashed, it's hashed, and that's what sits there in the database. But since we're going back to the plain text, we can do something a little more, uh, a little, I don't know, a little cooler, I guess, called a padding algorithm. So instead of just taking my message, encrypting it, and sending it, I'm going to take my message, 
and add a whole bunch of random garbage to the end of it. Then I'm going to encrypt that and then send it. But there's going to be a marker in there. It's going to be my message, some delimiter, and then all the random garbage, encrypt it and send it. Now, when somebody's decrypting this, the intended recipient decrypts, they look for that delimiter, they say that's where the message ends, throws away all the random garbage, takes the message, and reads the message. Now, this is somewhat similar to a salt, except that random garbage, that padding, is never sent or stored in plain text ever. It only exists inside the ciphertext, and then when it's decrypted, that's the only time where anybody can ever see it. It's never in plain text. So our attackers, with our brute force and dictionary attacks, they can't, they actually have to guess that padding. They actually have to guess it. It is part of the entropy. It adds entropy, it adds security. And even if I'm sending one Boolean, one bit of information, it's still secure because I'm using a padding algorithm. I send the same bit of information twice, it's going to be two completely different ciphertexts. And they're not going to be able to guess all of that random padding. We're going to add enough padding that's going to take, you know, heat death of the universe to guess all that padding. And this, I have, uh, my last slide says demo, but I want to do it right now. So if I have my crypto text, meet us at the stick, like I generated for lecture, or for the slides, I mean, and I'm running this, what I'm going to do is get a public-private key pair. I'm using RSA. And, uh, you know, the, it's Java, so there's all kinds of overhead and bulk here. But I'm encrypting and decrypting. I have to go into decrypt. Oh, I, I forget how, how much of a pain all this was. Uh, but in the end, I'm getting my public and private key pair. I'm encrypting twice, generating two ciphertexts, encrypting with my public key, printing out the ciphertext, and then decrypting both ciphertexts with the same private key. And if I run this, just wait a second. <laughs> it's happening. Uh, and we can see the two ciphertexts are completely different. We do decrypt back to the, the uh, original value, but the two ciphertexts, completely different values, and yes, they are the same length. Uh, so we do get the property that ciphertext will be uniform length when we're sending them. And if you need to send a message longer than that length, you'll, you'll encrypt in parts and send multiple crypto texts is generally what, you, what you'd end up doing. Uh, but... Uh, but yeah, ciphertexts are completely different. You're never going to guess this. You're never going to take this without my private key and figure out what I'm saying. But with the private key, we decrypt, throw away the extra padding, and just get the message. And the same private key both times, different ciphertexts, both get to the same message. So even if I'm sending the same message over and over and over again to the server, it's going to look completely different every time. Nobody gains information about that. They don't say, oh, I've seen this ciphertext before, because you won't see the same ciphertext twice. And, and you can see how long these things are. Oops, that was the wrong one. And you can see how long these things are. Like, the, there's more than 80 bits of entropy there. Okay. Did I really minimize the slides? All right, I exited full screen. So we're not brute forcing this. Salts don't add entropy, but padding does. Encryption is just flat out secure. You don't have to worry about how much entropy, like your strong passwords, thinking of strong passwords. None of that. Encryption is just secure. Or is it? So thinking back of how this was generated, is this actually secure? If we have... We know the algorithm. We, if, uh, we have E and N. This is the public key, right? Everybody on the planet has E and N. And if an attacker has P, Q, E, and, uh, P, Q, and E, those were the only choices that we made. We chose P and Q, and we chose E. So if anybody has P, Q, and E, they can just go through this process and generate the private key. They can compute D. 
based on that, just with those three values. They already have E, so check mark on that. All they need is P and Q, and they have N as part of the uh, public key. And N is P times Q. If you factor N into P and Q, you have the private key. All you have to do to break RSA encryption is factor N, and you're done. That's it. You have to factor N. And luckily, factoring, as it turns out, is really hard to do. Uh, so this is why we have to choose large primes. If you choose small primes, like, uh, you know, if I choose 7 and 11 and compute, you know, 77 is my N, uh, you're going to look at that in one glance. You don't even need a processor or computer or anything. You just say, oh, yeah, that's P and Q. We can factor. Like, factoring is something we can do. But when the P and Q are sufficiently large, and we're talking like thousands of bytes, when they're sufficiently large, it's just really hard to factor. We don't have any known algorithms, and we hope it's hard. There are no, known, no publicly known algorithms to do it. It's another one of those things where you know, some hacker in a shack somewhere could have figured this out and have a, a really fast, efficient factoring algorithm, and we just don't know about it, and they're just doing whatever they want, breaking encryption all over the place. We just don't know. So we hope it's hard, but there's no publicly known efficient way to factor. It seems like such a simple thing, factoring, but as it turns out, it's ridiculously hard. Uh, for what it's worth, for those of you who looked into this or, or know anything about uh, uh, I can't even remember the name of it, apparently, I don't know. Um, uh, computer uh, complexity theory. Uh, anybody who knows about complexity theory? Factoring, we hope that it's hard, but it's not NP complete, it's not NP hard. Uh, it's not in that realm, so it's like there's different levels of hardness. Uh, it's not quite NP hard, it's not traveling salesman hard. It's easier than that, and again, we think. Um, but it's not as easy as any algorithms where we just know how to solve the things. But nobody knows. There's no proof that proves that it is hard. There's no proofs that even NP hard problems are hard. We don't even know that. And factoring is easier. It's in the intersection of NP and co-NP, for those of you really interested. But uh, we hope it's hard, or else RSA breaks. Then what? Yeah, if you have a quantum computer. You need a quantum computer first. So, yeah, eventually, factoring, there is a, which I, I thought I had on one of these slides. I do have it on one of these slides. I don't know where it is. If you have a quantum computer that can work on thousands of qubits, which we're pretty far away from that now, uh, then, yeah, you can break RSA. Uh, but it'll be a while. And like I said, that's when we just moved to, public, to uh, elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, so we have another issue. Everybody knows E and N. That's the public key. And to send a message, we have C. Anybody who's sniffing packets out of the air has C, the crypto text. We have E. We have N. So what we have to figure out is M. Well, that's the, what we call the discrete log of E, which is the discrete log problem, the discrete log of E mod N. And if anybody can compute that, they can grab ciphertext, take the public key, and figure out what the underlying text is. It's still, again, just math, and math to the rescue again, we hope. Anyway, discrete log's really hard. Discrete log and factoring, these are two things called cryptographic primitives. And if you can prove that breaking your crypto system reduces to one of these problems, then you have security. The crypto community is happy with you. You reduce down to a cryptographic primitive. If uh, breaking your crypto system implies somebody solved the cryptographic primitive efficiently, usually in polynomial time, uh, then you have a strong crypto system. So this is another cryptographic primitive, luckily, because if either one of them, discrete log or factoring, is broken, then RSA is broken. Yeah. Actually, thought I had a few more slides. Where's my slide with the... 
Yeah, quantum computers. So if you have a quantum computer with a lot of qubits, you know, they're getting bigger, they're getting better. Over time, it probably happen. But uh, we're a long way from that right now. RSA is still used quite a bit in practice. I thought I had a few more slides, so I, I missed my timing on that one. But if we, oops. Connection is secure, cert is valid. So I don't know how easy that is to see. But if we look at my certificate, I haven't looked at this in a while. Like my certificate that I got from Let's Encrypt does use RSA. Like this is still a, a, a crypto system used in practice. And there's my public key. It's 2K bytes. And one more thing. The fingerprint, when we're uh, verifying hashes, SHA-256 still used in practice as well. Like these algorithms I'm showing are still used. They're getting, you know, they're getting dated and stuff. Uh, but they are still used and still useful. But if we go to, say, google.com, some of you may have heard of this site. Connection is secure, cert is valid, details. They're using elliptic curve public key. So they're using, they're on elliptic curve stuff. A lot of major corporations, if they're concerned about their security, they're already on to elliptic curves. Uh, they're not going to mess with the, the older stuff. They're still using SHA-256 for their fingerprint, though, for what it's worth. All right, any questions on anything? Next time we'll talk about, uh, oh, that's the wrong week, actually getting all the way to HTTPS, the theory behind it, and then Friday's going to be the more practical, how do we actually do this? And Friday's demo will probably spill over to Monday, and then we'll do, um, we'll probably do this demo on Monday, and I don't know what we'll do the next two days. Come up with something cool. Yeah, it, it's a it's TLS, but yeah, uh, uh, we'll we'll wait till Wednesday. Um, but yeah, there's a handshake to figure out what encryption. Yeah, because the certificates they can have different protocols, different uh, crypto schemes, and everything. There has to be a handshake to negotiate all that, and to get the certificate to begin with, like all that has to happen, and a key exchange. There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff to it. <clears throat> 